I get near the Shabbos. Shabbos, Shabbos, Um, okay, and welcome back to another episode, my dear friends, of Around the Shabbos Table. I have with us today a very fascinating guest. He is the historical consultant of the newly remastered Academy Award-winning Holocaust film, The Last Days. His name is Dr. Michael Berenbaum, or Dr. Berenbaum, even though he doesn't like that. <laughs> before the film, um, what I saw is that before the film had been remastered, it was, it was actually quite difficult since it had won its Academy Award in the, in the past few years. It's been hard to, uh, to actually get the film, to get a copy of it. So that also speaks to the importance of these kinds of um, endeavors that you take you take an, a film from the late 90s and you remaster it and obviously it's it's content is quite important to do that so it speaks to the importance of the uh, of the film itself so the film is also it's available on Netflix around the world so I so I understand it was in the US and uh, I checked here in Israel and it's available here as well so if you've seen the film already it's probably been a while since you've seen it and even if uh, and if you haven't seen it, it's always important. It is a masterful masterpiece of a film, in my uh, in my opinion, <laughs> which is not not uh, not the critic, but uh, just saying I thought it was beautiful and I thought it brought me to tears and to really um, an important place of of thinking about the Holocaust and bringing it back into my conscious um, since since the time I watched it. So um, and bringing bringing those messages alive. So talking. You know, uh, talking about the message of the Holocaust, that's something, Dr. Merriman, that I, I want to get into as well. What are, what are things that you know and see? That's going to be something we're, we're going to discuss um, here as well. But before we get into the film, The Last Days, and your work there, I, wanna, I, I really want to just get to know you a little bit um, and talk about, we know that you're obviously a scholar, a professor, a rabbi, a writer, um, and a historian who is deeply involved in Holocaust uh, studies. But can you, just get, can you give us a, a background to yourself, where you came from, and how you got interested and uh, um, in this? Let me, let me begin by saying I was born in the post-war world, and I was educated in Hebrew-speaking yeshivot, uh, where my teachers, because they were Hebraists, were either survivors or refugees. And we spoke a magnificent Hebrew. Israel destroyed that Hebrew. We spoke the equivalent of a Shakespearean Hebrew. So when I went for directions the first time in Israel, I said, The equivalent of, if your heart inclineth in my direction, would you kindly indicate to me, thy humble servant, what is the proper path upon one which, which one should tread to reach his anointed destination? Naturally, the Israelis laughed at me, but the reality is my teachers were either survivors or refugees. And we were the generation of whipped cream and ice cream that had to make up for a generation that was lost. And we heard two words. We heard camps, death, and ch three words, camps, death, and children. But nobody ever said it. Nobody ever told us the thing. I also grew up in a yekka shul. And, your, uh, and my Yekka Shul was comprised of, uh, I grew up in Kew Gardens. My Yekka Shul was comprised of refugees who left Germany in 1939-40, or they left Antwerp, and they had something, um, they were mostly in the diamond business, and they had portable wealth. Because in the diamond business, you could put your wealth in your pocket, you could swallow it, you could put it in, you could sew it into the lining of your clothes, you could do whatever have you. And they were recreating in New York what they had left behind in Frankfurt or in Antwerp. But nobody spoke about the Holocaust. And I remember also as a child waking up in the morning when they just invented, this is way, way, way before your, even your imaginary time, and, and they had just invented the clock radio. And instead of being woken up by an alarm clock, all of a sudden you're woken up generally by music. But I got woken up at 6.30 in the morning by Martin Agronsky 
reporting from Jerusalem on the Eichmann trial. Make a long story short, I became interested in a historical question. Why did the Jews not go out of business after defeat? Other ancient people were defeated. Most other ancient peoples disappeared. We, tenacious as we are, I'm Cheorov, didn't go out of business. Somebody turned to me and said, you're not asking an ancient question. You're asking the single most important contemporary question of Jewish life. In other words, after the massive defeat of the Shoah, how is it that the Jewish people doubled down on Jewish existence and even went to gather together in the state of Israel and recreated Jewish life and not only recreated Jewish life, but recreated Jewish life in a manner that probably exceeds the fabled world of Eastern Europe. More Jews are learning their Hasidism, which had been declared dead, was reborn. Orthodoxy, which had uh, declared as vanishing, was recreated. And look at the vibrancy and vitality of Jewish life in the state of Israel in all of its manifestations. So I began to write on the Shoah. That was at a young I, age, correct? At a young, at a young age. And I then um, was a young academic when I got a tremendous break which is I was invited, again, this is ancient history for you, but uh, 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 Aaron will understand, uh, uh, your, your father will understand this. It's ancient history for you. I was invited by Jimmy Carter to staff the President's Commission. And I got, had got invited to that because of my Jewish activism. I had gone to the Soviet Union in 76, was briefed by um, uh, Yitz Greenberg, Rabbi Irving Greenberg, because he had gotten thrown out of the Soviet Union, and I was to continue his conversations. We were planning an academic conference in um, December of 76. He was offered the directorship of the President's Commission. He didn't want to move down to Washington. They looked for a young person who knew the Holocaust, who was willing to move down to Washington, and uh, indeed got the job of the President's Commission on the Holocaust. So I staffed it and uh, um, left it for a while, and then came back in 1987 and was project director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We created the museum, we opened the museum, and to make a long story short, I had a problem in the 19, mid to late 1970s. I got to spend $190 million in, 19, um, in, in, in the late 1980s and 1990s, I did everything I wanted to do. I was too young and too poor to retire. So the question, and, and after we created the museum, the task was administration. And creating an institution is much more interesting than administering an institution, even though I take my hat off to the administrators, because only if you run a museum that has lighting and has crowd control and all of that, only then can you have a great visit. So I was invited by Spielberg to head the Survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation. And we took 52,000 testimonies in um, 37 languages in 52 countries. Now, if you talk about origins, what did I end up doing in my life? I ended up articulating to the American people what nobody could tell me when I was a child and then giving an opportunity to my teachers and every other survivor to tell the story that we weren't capable of listening to in the 1950s and early 60s, and to bring it to an idiom that was useful for your generation and your children and children's children. So I was involved in essentially being the midwife to the encounter of the American people with the Shoah and ultimately in the survivors of the Shoah, the encounter of the world with the testimony of the survivors. And this has been a, the, the rarest privilege of my life. That tells you the story in, a, in, in as quickly as I can, but it all began in silence and I was um, empowered 
to bring it into a visual dimension, a cinematographic dimension, a museum dimension, and most importantly, to compile the greatest oral testimony, visual testimony imaginable of any event in human history. Now, what is its importance? Let me just imagine if you were sitting down at your, at your Seder table and you had access to people who were slaves in Egypt. Right? All we have is, all we have is the narration. Imagine if you could listen to slaves in Egypt, but not only Moshe, not only Aaron, and not only Miriam, but Shlemela, who was a little bricklayer. And we had everybody from great leaders to bakers and candlestick makers to cobblers and, 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 and blacksmiths to leaders of industry, all of whom were be able, able to articulate what they experienced, what this is going to do in 100 years, in 200 years, in 500 years is unimaginable because history is normally written by elites. And this is the first history that will have the record to be written by Amcha, by everybody. And the more you deal with the Holocaust, you more, the more you understand that it's the power of the individual story. The devil is really in the detail, but the courage is also in the detail. The resilience is also in the detail. The resistance is also in the detail. Faith is also in the detail. Loss of faith is also in the detail. So this is what my life ended up being. And after uh, I left the Shoah Foundation, I decided that I really wanted to engage in what you could call in modern uh, times, academic and entrepreneurship. So I've created museums, I've created films, I've helped create films, and I uh, edited the Encyclopedia Judaica to brought together, uh, you know, 25,000 scholars, uh, uh, 22 volumes, 16 million words. I'm one of a couple of people who have read all of them. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I learned something in, in the process, and it, it's been... It's been a, a life of, of, of enormous service and privilege. When you mentioned something in the beginning, and my father and I were talking about this when, when you know, the opportunity came to speak to you, we, um, we sat down, we just talked about, you know, how, how, do, how do we both view the Holocaust? And you mentioned something that, that struck a chord with, with, with what we were talking about, that you mentioned that you felt that um, you were making up for a lost generation and that the responsibility that you had was um, to, to make up were your words. How do you feel that you, were, that you were making up and is telling the stories alone making up? Well, let's begin. I was told that we were to make up for a lost generation. And I was told that we were inadequate to make up for a lost generation. They were Dolem and we were spoiled Americans. Living off, living off the fat of the land, and um, and the like. So um, that imposed on whatever we accomplished a little measure of modesty and a lot of measure of responsibility. So I think that I, I think that my generation has done justice to the memory of the Holocaust because of the survivors and because of their impetus. And because we have carried that on and done justice to the memory. Remember, when I was growing up, the question is, would this event be remembered? And now the question is changed. It's how will this event be remembered? And that's a different question. We now know the Holocaust is going to be remembered. But it's going to be remembered. And, and, and our fight now is to make sure that it's remembered in a way that does honor to its victims and that also doesn't create what we've seen in certain manifestations in recent times in the animus, what I would call a new, new thing. I'm not worried about Holocaust denial. 
I'm worried about vulgarization, minimalization. I'm also worried about what we can term Holocaust envy. In other words, um, somebody walks in and has a thing, SM, uh, um, 6M, WE, 6 million wasn't enough, or Auschwitz staff. You, th this, is, this is a new dimension. This is a new dimension of fighting for the nature and the integrity of the memory. We're also um, struggling to make sure uh, there's a paradox of the Shoah. Paradox was referred was uh, first mentioned by Yitz Greenberg, and it's a very important paradox. The innocent feel guilty, and the guilty feel innocent. Let me repeat that because it, it strikes a nerve. The innocent feel guilty, the, gu the guilty feel innocent. There is a vast literature of survivor guilt. There's no literature of perpetrator guilt. I can, I can point, I have a library here of, of, of a couple of thousand books. I can point to four essays that deal with survivor guilt, with perpetrator guilt. Uh, let's take a, another um, half example of that. Who's the most innocent generation in Germany? The third generation. They're the one that now feels responsible. The perpetrators don't feel responsible. There's a, a, a new movie out called The, the, the uh, Last Account, which interviews men in their 80s and 90s who were perpetrators. Not even what you would call in Hebrew, zechel davar of shame. Not even, not even a mem, you know, not even an inkling of shame. We did it, but the third generation feels responsible. They don't necessarily feel guilty, but they feel responsible, and that's one of the reasons why, in Israel, in the United States, in museums and the like, you have Germans and Austrians who are doing, doing national service by remembering the Holocaust, um, and and. That is a, a very important um, means. Let me switch for a moment just to talk about this film. Yeah, uh, I would love to get into that as well, yeah. Because that, that, that's, how, that's how we got. The Last Days tells the story of Hungarian Jews. And Hung the Hungarian story can be told in one paragraph. On March 19th, the Germans invaded. In April and May, the Jews were ghettoized from the 15th of May to the 8th of July. 437,402 Jews were deported, primarily to Auschwitz-Birkenau. On July 8th, the only living Jewish community in Hungary was in Budapest. And the rest of the time was a battle between the forces that wanted to deport and kill these Jews and the few people who wanted to rescue the Jews and the Soviet troops that were advancing all the way through. And we told the story of Hungarian Jews by depicting a series of survivors. So the Hungarian Jewish story is compressed. And Hung Hungary had the largest number of survivors because they ran out of time to kill them. And also because if they were shipped to Auschwitz, Hungarian Jews only had to suffer through one winter. Polish Jews had three and four winters, and they always said a low number on your arm got you respect in Auschwitz because it meant you got through the winter. What does the winter mean? The winter means that you're sitting in, in with one piece of clothing that's inadequate, in temperature that is, uh, you know, 20 degrees below zero, and you have no warmth. And between October and May, there's not a moment of rest. So the idea that you see winter coming back and you imagine what it takes, it means you're not comfortable between October and May. An incredible concept. And that's why most of the survivors of Auschwitz were Hungarian Jews. One winter and the like, 
fact, and we have a diversity of people, we also did something else in the movie, which is we brought several of them with their families back home. Right. You just for dramatic effect itself, that's like, but just back, to watch or back them. To, or back to a place that used to be home. Because um, the, the question and when they did that, you had a combination of two things take place. Number one, they met a few people who remembered the world before. Today, you wouldn't have that experience because the gener generation, that generation is gone. And you also have the sense that they can't go home. The world they left behind is no longer there. Even if the buildings are the same, the community's absence, and you have a, a beautiful metaphor. And the beautiful metaphor is what I call the presence of absence and the absence of presence. In other words, it's the negative space, the absence of presence and the presence of absence. Uh, I, I have a, a wonderful, um, let me give you a, the most vivid example of that that I know. And when I go back to Poland, I do it every time. There are buildings in Poland in which there is the indentation where the mezuzah used to be. For 300 years, maybe even some places for 700 years, a mezuzah was on the doorpost of, of the, on the right doorpost of, of the entrance to the house, and it left an indentation. The Jews are gone, the mezuzah is gone, the indentation is still there. And when I walk and I see a home like that, I go up to the doorpost and I put my hand over there and I really feel what's, who's missing, what's missing. And it tells, it tells me what you have there, which is an incredible experience. What was it? What was it like to for you to to revisit this film and the the idea of re you know remastering it, but re it was really re, revisiting it in a sense. What was it like that for you? Um, number one, remastering essentially means you're using twenty uh, first century technology to deal with nineteen ninety technology. This is a nineteen ninety eight film, so you're now bringing it forward twenty one years, which means the colors are more vivid. But you're also re-engaging with the experience. And the other thing that we have is several of the survivors are still alive. Most are not. And in fact, um, um, in my life, I have written the obituaries and the eulogies for several of the survivors uh, who were in the film. And you also see these people 20 two years or 23 years younger. And there's a difference between somebody who is 70 and somebody who's 90. Uh, there's a vitality, there's a vibrancy. Even in one case, in the case of Alice Locke Kahana, she is no longer, um, uh, one of her sons has even had a stroke and is no longer articulate and, and, and able to communicate in the same way so you see them in their vitality. And she tells a story in the film that's worth the entire film. She tells the story of Shabbos, of Friday afternoon, Shabbos in the latrine. Now to understand this story, you have to understand something about the Shoah that's gonna go on the edge but you'll forgive me because it's L'Shem Shamayim. The Nazis wanted to reduce the Jews. In their words, they wanted to create out of uh, Auschwitz Anus Munde, the rear end of the universe. They wanted to reduce the Jews to a piece of feces. The one place the Nazis would not go was to latrine because the latrine was designed to reduce the dignity of the Jews. It had ni neither water to clean oneself, nor water to evacuate the odor. So you can imagine, and they had structurally, they had for 35,000 people, they had 70 latrines. 
Now, the only way you can imagine it is think of what happens in a stadium of 35,000 people with 70 latrines, but imagine people are going to stay there for 24 hours, seven days a week, not for a three-hour game. So they want to reduce the, the Jews to a piece of feces. The Jews understood, and Alice Lakahana tells the story, the Jews understood that was the one place where the Nazis would not go. So that's the one place where the younger Jews came to sing some of the songs of Shabbat, some of the Zmirot. And if you think of that as the ultimate manifestation of a rebellion against dehumanization, They want to reduce us to a piece of feces. And that's the place in which we have an echo of Shabbat. That gives me telling that story chills and should give anybody who hears it a sense of what is spiritual defiance? What is saying to them you can destroy everything but I still have the capacity of the spirit. That's not yet broken, at least not for some of us. That, to my mind, worth the whole film. It's an enormously, uh, enormously powerful story, and it's only one of the stories we tell. That's three minutes of an hour and a half film. <laughs> I was just wondering, between the stories and the Holocaust memorials and all of the things that you've been involved in, <clears throat> who is your target audience? Who is, who is this, is all of these memorials and all of these, all of these stories and all of these films, who were it for? And, and what, what are you hoping that, that each target population gets out of it? That's a terrific question. When we created the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, we had a very particular target audience. It was the non-Jew from Kansas. And meaning that if you take your most distant and your roughest audience, and you essentially say that that's the audience I want to communicate with, then um, you create something that can be understood by all. But if you ask me, I'll, I'll tell you a, a story about museums. Museums have three types of visitors. Skimmers, swimmers, and deep divers. <laughs> a, a, a skimmer wants to do the equivalent of what a billboard does. What is a billboard meant? It's meant to be seen at 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour for seven seconds. Right? But it's still got to communicate something. A swimmer is somebody who gets wet in the water and is willing to read, listen, hear. And a deep diver wants to learn everything. So we try to create a museum that always has three levels. And a film also has to have multiple levels. But the idea is that you have to be able to reach your audience and allow them to understand. But I've created, uh, look, I've, I've worked in many different communities. I've worked in, uh, um, I, I'm joking, because I work in the Haredi community. And in, in when I work, and I've become, ironically, on the Holocaust, the equivalent of the Rav HaMachshir, the rabbi who says this material is kosher, this material is faith, and the like. And consequently, uh, you want to, grapple with that you want to you want to speak to that audience in a language that they can understand so for example in we we created something in that audience in which we have an interaction uh in the ghettos and in the camps and in the years 33 through 39 about the shalot and chuvot that the rabbis that the rabbis were asked and the answers they couldn't could not give that wouldn't work for a different audience. Or, for example, we have um, the Torah that was recited by Kalamas Shapiro. 
and the que- the question the question and I'm always interested in what story you know um, a rabbi not only speaks of the Torah but he speaks to a community that's experiencing what they're experiencing. So what story do you tell? And also, what can you not say? Let me give you a wonderful example from um, uh, pre-war Germany. A reform rabbi by the name of Joachim Prince is not permitted to preach. But he, they're still in, before 38, he's rabbi in 37, they're still allowed to pray. So he has his congregation develop a chant he doesn't say it in German. He says it in Hebrew to a congregation that doesn't quite understand Hebrew either. All who think of me, what? Evil? Mehera speedily. Change their advice. Kalkel machshvotam. So all of a sudden, he's using a language of tradition to try to strengthen his people. Or the other rabbi who did something miraculous, he interrupted the Aleinu prayer, which everybody knows. And he adds, but we stand erect before men. Which is a way of sneaking in a little bit of Musur, a little bit of what? A little bit of lesson and trying to do it in a way because there's a Gestapo man in the synagogue who can arrest you, who can send you to a concentration camp. You have to make your points very subtly. So I'm always interested, for example, on who was Amalek? Who was Paro? Who was Haman? Who was Achashverosh? But it depends on what your who your audience is. But I generally try to reach uh, multiple audiences. I mean, I, I've done museums in Poland and in Mexico. So you try to reach a different audience there, and you can't presume they know. But the the most important thing is: look, we take this all from film, but more than that, we even take it from the Torah. What's the first what's the first Rashi about Breshit? If the Torah was a book of laws, it would have to begin in the twelfth chapter of the book of Exodus. It would have to begin Parakut Bet and Shmot, that's the first halacha. But the Torah would be an impoverished an impoverished uh, book, beginning that not giving us all of the narrative and the like. People identify with stories. And you can communicate the most difficult, the most difficult concepts in the world with stories. And our method in museums and our method in films is to tell a story. What is the difference between a film and a museum? In a film, you have moving imagery and a captive audience. In a museum, you have captive imagery and a moving audience. The audience moves from place to place. The imagery stays in that place, both of them have to tell a story. And only one of your tools is the written word, because what you see in both changes the nature of your experience. The fact that these people, for example, are not talking heads, but they're walking back into Auschwitz. The fact that they're walking into their barracks. The fact that they're walking into their hometown. They could talk all you want about that. The power is what? In the visual and in the word in and the words enhance the visual. What's the message that you hope that Kansas gets? And what's the message that you hope that that youngster, that fifteen year old in Kew Gardens? That when he and his yeshiva perhaps okay, sees me, this let movie. Me, let me talk about let me talk about an overall philosophical message, and then what I want people to get out of it. <clears throat> if you ask me what I believe has been accomplished, 
I'm doing something profoundly, probably in my mind, the most, the most deeply Jewish thing I can do. What did the biblical generation do with the story of the Exodus? They took a particular story, they made it universal, and they used it to enhance human ethics, to be sensitive to, first of all, to create a Sabbath, to be sensitive to the poor, to the widow, to the orphan, not, for example, take a person's utensils so they couldn't make a living. They used it to enhance ethical sensitivity, to make sure that slavery could not be slavery again to enlarge human responsibility, to enhance human dignity, to promote human decency. And they did it in a particular way which is transmitted from generation to generation. My hope is that the Shoah becomes a story that remains particular, but it becomes a universal story of human indignity that is used to enhance human dignity, to plead for human decency, and to enlarge the domain of human responsibility. What do I want a kid to get? I want a kid to understand that A, you can't be a perpetrator. B, if you can help it, you shouldn't be a victim. There's no glory in victimization. Suffering is real. I once spoke to a great Hasidic master who taught me that by telling me a pasuk. He said, he pronounced it a little bit differently, but I can only, I'll pronounce the Hebrew the way I pronounce uh, the Hebrew. God has great, given me great yesurin, great anguish, but didn't give me over to, to uh, death. And he's described the death marches by saying the greatest anguish was we didn't die. Death would have been easy. What we went through was worse. What do I mean by that? We shouldn't be a victim. We shouldn't be a perpetrator. We shouldn't be a bystander who watches and watches evil take place. We should be an upstander, a rescuer, somebody who, first of all, goes in, alleviates, uh, goes in and tries to stop, alleviate, help, and heal. And sometimes people ask me, where was the presence of God in the Shoah? And why do we presume the presence of God was in the perpetrator and not in the healer and the rescuer? And to my mind, if God was present in the Shoah, he was present and manifest in those who tried to heal, tried to help, tried to alleviate, tried to prevent, tried to do a whole range of things. Why do we have to presume it's Hitler? And not a Wallenberg, and not and not a Karski, and not and not a a a, 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 a um, not not uh, uh, Irina Sandler, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All of all of the people who did it, and not in the presence of a a, a great um, a minister in Le Chambon, France, who said to his congregation, "Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul." And with all thy might and love thy neighbor as thyself, go practice it. And his village became a hamlet for 5,000 Jews. So if God is present, that's where God is present for me. And I, I, I don't want to claim faith for anybody else. But I want to say that's, that's where I find the presence of God, if at all, in the Shoah. Not in Hitler, not in the punishment, not in the evil, not in the manifest. I think that's a message that uh, that, that definitely resonates with me. Um, and in, in terms of passing on that message, that's a that's definitely a message that uh, is is teachable and is pass pass onable. You know, you can you can recreate that in uh, in so many ways. Very universal message, also as well. That's what I try. That's what I try to do. I try to speak to multiple audiences. Right. But I, I, I find to, also, I, it's interesting, I find also sometimes... Try we, to speak with integrity out of the Jewish experience. Right, because it's, and, and as we see, like, you know, we're on the world stage right now, and the message of the Holocaust is, is relevant to everyone. 
it's also relevant to the Jews. It's also relevant to each sect of Judaism, and everybody has to take their message. But there has to be a message that we can, you know, push I, push back at the world as well. I have a very peculiar dream. I wish I would live long enough that the Holocaust becomes irrelevant. You know, it's, I I I wish that what I taught, what would be the ideal ending of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The ideal ending of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum would be, that's how these idiots behaved in the 20th century. We, post-Holocaust people, could not behave like that. We couldn't have such anti-Semitism, we couldn't have such hatred, couldn't have such racism, couldn't have such evil, couldn't have such slaughter, couldn't have such such destruction of human life and human dignity. It, it, it's repulsive to us that human beings could behave like that. Look at us, we've learned all those lessons. I would then be happy to, to go to my grave and say, this is an irrelevant man who has nothing to say to the world, and I'm happy. I would have done my job. The sadness to me is that I'm now still relevant. That's a tragedy of our world. And frankly, it's, it, it's the thing that irks me the most. And by the way, true for Jews, true for non-Jews, true for the entire world. Totally. Well, I'm probably the first guy to come on your show and say, I dream of becoming irrelevant. <laughs> yeah. You hear Ratzon that you should be irrelevant. Irrelevant. <laughs> Amen. Um, yeah, and also speaks to your, uh, your, the responsibility of the mission. That uh, speaks to that as well. So we appreciate that very much. Thank you for coming on. Um, thank you for sharing your, your, uh, your meaningful mission with all of us. Um, if there's anything else you want to tell us about, you know, the film or yourself or a message to our listeners, I think. Let's say good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. We always end with, with pass the challenge. Pass the challenge. <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I, I have to tell you, I, I, you can't say that to me. I'm, I'm the grandson of a butcher. <laughs> so and you didn't eat challenge. And my, grandf my grandfather said, told us that he understood, he knew better than anybody else what people put in the chillin. So he never served chillin. <laughs> well, the joke so, is, Dr. Dr. Berman, we're from California. I grew up in San Diego. We didn't really have chillin either. <laughs> well, we we laugh because in our show, cholent is regarded as a great uh, a great uh, dish, and and people flock to the cholent. And I look at it as a butcher's grandson, and I would be betraying my grandfather if I put if I put a drop of cholent into 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 my stomach. So I I I uh, I have a very peculiar response to cholent. It's to be faithful to my grandfather, Masorat Avot Siman Labani.